Hi, I'm Femi OK, and you're in the stream. Today, Libya has a new UN-backed unity government that's receiving a lot of support from the international community. But with two rival administrations inside the country, will it find enough domestic backing to give Libyans political stability? Hmm, how many times have we talked about new administrations in Libya and what that might mean for Libyans? Um, many times. We are asking that question again. Our digital producer Malika Valau has a few answers, I think. <laughs> well, I don't know. I think uh, what I'm seeing online is that there is no clear answer to that question mm -hmm. of whether or not this unity government will have support. I'll show you just a taste of what people are saying, though. This is Mohanned on Twitter, who says, Libyans have not been this hopeful and united over change in ages. I think this time they want to move forward. On the other hand, though, he gets a reply from Fazan Libya, who says, Says who? Only some people from Tripoli in the capital are celebrating. I don't see people in Benghazi in the east dancing at all. So we want to know where you fall on this debate. Tweet us your take with hashtag AJStream. Hello, I'm Hussam. I'm a Libyan doctor in London, and I'm in the stream. Libya's new unity government began its work from a heavily guarded naval base in the capital of Tripoli, despite threats from rival factions. The government, which was formed in Tunisia under a UN-mandated peace deal, will attempt to end the political stalemate and violence that has plagued the country since the uprising that brought down Muammar Gaddafi five years ago. Since 2014, Libya has had two competing governments, a UN-backed parliament in the eastern city of Tobruk, and the General National Congress based in Tripoli. The UN hopes that a new unity government will be able to deliver political stability and tackle growing threats from ISIL and Al-Qaeda. The ongoing political instability, insecurity, violence between different groups in the country has made daily life very difficult for Libyans. But the Prime Minister, Fayez al-Sarraj, has said that Libya's new government is coming to serve the citizen and that their slogan is reconciling and reconstruction among Libyans. So, what do Libyans hope to see from this new government? To help us discuss this, we're joined by Hassan Maraja, a Libyan journalist, Bilal Betama, a lawyer and activist now living in Windsor, Canada, Anas El Gamati, he's founder and general director of the Sadek Institute, and Ayat Amina, founder of the Libyan youth movement group, also known as Shabab Libya. Good to have you here, everybody. Hmm, Hassan, let's see if you know the answer to this. Who is running Libya right now? Uh, what part of Libya? Um, I guess uh, every little city, every little town is run by different uh, different militias, different people controlling it, different administrations. Um, I think if you ask uh, if you ask that question to Libyans, you'll get a lot of very different answers. Uh -huh. uh, Anas, I think also it's important yeah. to remember. Um, how do you define running Libya? Mm -hmm. uh, Libya hasn't really been functioning as a normal, stable country uh, since 2011. So uh, it's a very wide um, array that you'll find across the country. Bilal, what are you getting a sense of who's in charge right now? I think that's the problem itself. We don't have someone in charge. I think this is the biggest problem. We don't have people that are in charge. We don't have a clear leadership. We don't have, have the the clear route to stability in Libya. That's our problem. So that's one view. Um, I will say the majority view that I am seeing online, Femi, is people saying mm. that, yes, there is a unity government, and a lot of people are trying to get in line um, in support under that government. So this is Anne Marie, though, who has a concern. She says, this new government needs to move fast. The last thing the East needs is to feel left out of that unity government. So Anas, I want to bring you in there on this uh, about bringing in the East, bringing in uh, Benghazi, bringing in Tobruk cities that are in the East, and whether or not they're going to feel included. Well, that's a good question as to who um, runs Libya, as to how you can form uh, an inclusive uh, and a, a, you know, a a less uh, exclusive style of governance in the country. Um, but in reality, to answer your question, it's that militias run Libya today, and militias in the West and militias in the East are the key towards um, achieving any kind of stable uh, political life. But they're also the, uh, the, the door that allowed for instability over the last four and a half, five years. Now, to really understand how to bring in the East, there has to be a conversation that includes 
civil society, but it will also have to include um, what is now seeming like a very strong tribal current that is both in, in, inclusive in the East, but also in, in the West. And then also the militias um, and the uh, Operation Dignity uh, uh, backed uh, militias and, and, uh, and Libyan National Army units have to be included in that conversation. And I think that's been the biggest question as to how to also include the West. And I think this, this notion about how to capture the East or how to capture the West or how to capture the capital is almost like the man who says, I have a cold. In reality, it's the cold that has him. It's not him who is in control of the cold. And it's the same with trying to capture the capital. A politician with a suit and tie can't capture a capital full of militias. It's the militias that will capture him. And it's the militias that will allow for the style of politics of the government, which is that you pay me, uh. and I'll support you if you support me. And if you support me in material wealth, or if you support me in, in financial terms, or if you support me in ammunition. And I think across the board, stylistically, that's the same for the East as well. Uh. See, Hassan, I'm trying to work out logistically, how did this work out? So we've got uh, an administration in Tobruk, an administration in Tripoli that only partially support the new UN-backed government. So at least two other seats of power. We're not even talking about militias here or extreme groups either. Logistically, how will this work for this new UN-backed government? Well, I think it's going to be very difficult. Um, it'll be extremely difficult for, for, the, for this uh, to work. I mean, as you explained, the, the main problem that this administration has is that there are a lot of political and military rivals who do not want them there. Um, the, uh, we, we saw a very similar scene when, when the HOR uh, had to move, the House of Representatives, so the Parliament in Tobruk had to move to the east in 2014 because a war broke out in Tripoli. Um, and the UN, the UN and the international community backed that parliament, but because a rival administration with military power on the ground set up in the, in the West, there was nothing that could be done. Um, the UN and uh, the international community have tried very hard to push and, 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 and force this, this government into power in Tripoli, um, and, and they, they've succeeded in getting them to Tripoli, I guess, but how to get uh, everybody else, you know, Anas was talking about uh, including the East and these different militias and different administrations in the conversation, but I think a lot of the problem, a lot of the time, the problem is that they don't want to be included. They don't want to uh. talk. They want to um, run the thing. They want to run things the way they see fit. Mm. And Ayat, I see I, you. I see you nodding there. I, I want to bring this to your attention um, when we talk about not wanting to be included. This is Omar, and he says the GNA, and that is the acronym for this uh, UN-backed body, the Government of National Accord. It needs to listen to the demands of the East and the South. Many in the East are pro-LNA, that's another abbreviation there, but basically that is the Libyan National Army um, that's headed by a general uh, in the East, which we've done a show on, General uh, Khalifa Hifzer. And so this person says to be successful, they need to work with that army. Where does the support of the army lie right now, and is that important in, in moving forward? Um, I think in eastern Libya there was a specific moment where uh, the disintegration of security was so bad that a response happened organically from Benghazi, from armed groups that formed the Libyan National Army, led by a general, in response to the persistent assassination campaigns against civil society, activists, against lawyers, against journalists, against other army officials. So that was a very organic uh, movement that got popular support because of the deterioration of the situation in Benghazi. Uh, so in a, in a unity government definitely needs to include a group like like that, which uh, on some level represents Libya. But I think the most persistent issue here today in Libya is the security issue. Uh, we have had several governments, almost a revolving door of governments, and Libyans are willing to have or want to see a governing power, but it has to offset the security needs in the country. Until that can be addressed, uh, the government will not be able to secure its seat. And Libyans are really looking for leadership. Libyans will support a government that supports them at the end of the day. See, I, you're talking about Libyans here, and I, I feel that we've got two things that are happening. So you've got the infrastructure of Libya, infrastructure in air quotes, politics up here, and then you've got Libyans down here who are just trying to get by, and those we've got so many responses okay. from Libyans trying to get by. Right, on, on what daily life is like. And yeah. Hayat, I'm actually glad that you mentioned security because it's so intertwined with daily life. People are telling us, this is uh, Rafferty who says, an acquaintance who works in a bakery, uh, a woman came with a can of tomato puree to exchange it for bread. 
she had no money. And so that is a common thing. People are saying there's not enough money or, or liquid money in, in the banks. But he goes on to say Libyans also need security. There's no point in having money in the bank when you're burgled on the way back home. Bilal, do you have friends who are telling you similar things, that they're afraid of, of being robbed? Of course. We have, uh, we have two wars in Libya, a civil war and a war with terrorism. So in some parts of Libya, the security is completely lacking. Cities like Sirte are under complete control of ISIS. And that's a conversation we need to have with the government. What are they planning on doing to ISIS? Uh, the civil war, the other civil war with, with Libyans fighting each other. Nusrata uh, militias are still sending boats to Benghazi to this day carrying weapons and extremists. So we do have a war in Libya, and that situation is not over by any chance. Hassan, there was a story that you shared with us. It was a kidnapping story. Is that an everyday occurrence in Libya? Can you tell us that story? It might not be an everyday occurrence, but it's definitely something that um, daily, daily life in, in, in Libya you, you, you do get concerned about. Um, so the story that I shared with you earlier on was, was of a, uh, a young uh, boy who was kidnapped uh, for ransom uh, in an area west of Tripoli, the capital. Um, when, when, he, when, when the parents basically weren't able to pay the ransom because they didn't have the, the, the money, um, the boy was, the, the boy was, was killed. Um, he was, his body was found, he was tortured and, uh, and, and left on the side of the road dead. Uh, this is um, you know, a, a, side of, a side of Libya that you definitely don't see in the, in the international media, a side, of, uh, a side of Libya that isn't getting covered as uh, I, I guess it's seen as just the, the smaller uh, picture of the for, for, from a bigger story going on around Libya, I had um, but I think. Go yeah, ahead. Sorry, I, yeah, I, I think like uh, you know as uh, Bilal was uh, mentioning, you know the security situation in different cities in, in Libya. You know, being as, as a journalist who has visited you know multiple places in Libya, including the south, the east, Benghazi, um, Tripoli, and Misrata, and other places uh, in in the country, I think something that I have realized is that the security situation is bad everywhere. If you all you have to, you know, put, put, putting aside uh, regular civilians and things like that, if, if you're not wanted there, whoever you are, uh, you are going to face uh, problems. You know, if, if you're even seen as, as ever so slightly having any relation to another party, another group uh, in, the, in the country, you're, you're straight away put in danger. Um, you know, I've, I've, uh, I've had threats sent to me just for speaking to uh, uh, an opponent, whether that be a military or political uh, opponent, or being or writing a story about them, it it doesn't really matter um, to to these groups. And I think that's one of the main problems that that we have. You know, you were talking about bringing them and including them into a conversation. These groups don't want to to work together. Um, they want to do things their own way. I wanted to share just uh, one anecdote from someone named Aladdin on Twitter. Uh, he says, Libyans expected Libya to become a Miami or a Dubai, and now, and he means that after the uprising, now we just want stable electricity and better security in the whole country. So picking up on this security theme, one way to do it, NS, is by getting rid of militias. This is something you said a little bit earlier. You said militias run the country. So Anise here on Twitter says it would be a historic achievement if this new unity government were to dissolve militias into the army and police security first. How feasible is that, NS? Well, today it doesn't seem feasible. I think the main, the main reason today is that in 2014, uh, in May 2014, there was a civil war that emerged that included elements in Benghazi that were certainly extremists, uh, like the Salafi Jihadi group that was aligned to Al Qaeda um, and Salah Sharia. But they were also joined by more tribal elements uh, in that city, and they started to fight against Khalifa Haftar and against Operation Dignity backed militias and against uh, LNA backed militias. Now, in that respect, this kind of granular civil war doesn't allow you to fight a really precise war against terrorism. In 2016, that's desperately needed, and that's desperately needed because ISIS has made footholds now and made a real stronghold in Sirte, in the center of the city, in the center of the country. It has also had a presence in Dabna. It's also had a presence towards the west of the country, towards Tunisia, and it's been able to do that because of the way in which this war has been fought. Now, ultimately, trying to dissolve militias could have been done, I think, towards 2014 or 2015, but in 2016, whereby now these militias are not only viewed as the kind of groups or the kind of organizations that brought us into civil war, it should have been what 
really united the different groups that were the, the, the debating and having a dialogue in, uh, in the UN to try to back this GNA over the last 19 months. But now, instead of them being viewed as the curse that brought Libya into civil war, they're viewed as the, as the key towards fighting ISIS. Now, that's given them a new raison d'etre, it's given them a new lease of life, but it's also allowed this narrative to continue, which is that ultimately, a politician with a, with a suit and tie doesn't have the ability, doesn't have the force, doesn't have you know, the, the, the compelling argument to try and bring those down, but also because of the, the way in which this, this war has been fought, because of the, the very nature of terrorism, it's the fact that, they can, you know, that dreams are not as powerful as nightmares. If someone tells you that I will fight extremism, I'll fight you know, ISIS, and I'll fight them wherever they may be, and I'll fight them without you having to know who exactly that, that person is. So whether they fight your opponent, or whether they fight a political opponent, or whether they fight ISIS, you can't really tell. And that's the problem with today, uh, today in Libya, is that there is so much support for fighting terrorism, but we don't know whether, whether or not they're fighting terrorism exclusively in Misrata or in Benghazi or in Sirat or right. in Tripoli or anywhere else. But ultimately, Can I just the only ones that will do that are militias. And they're trying to get them to, to bring their weapons down at a time like this is almost impossible. I think just to um, add to that discussion that NS had, and I think those are super valid points, um, this is a moment where Libyan leadership can take this opportunity to pressure the international community to help them secure the country, um, to disarm these militias, reintegrate them into a national army, and then use these forces to fight against ISIS. I think the push now is really to fight against ISIS for Western interests. Uh, Libya has to be involved in this conversation for Libyan interests to help secure the country. Uh, the migrant crisis has been another issue that the that Europe has uh, seen um, as an inconvenience for them, and they're using this, again, as an opportunity to address their issues. Uh, this is a moment where the international community is focused on Libya. Libya needs to um, negotiate its best interest as well. And I think that um, this is a moment that uh, we really need to, to take a hold of. I want to show you um, a couple of comments from Libyans who are actually down on the ground. This was a rally in support of the new unity government, and this was uh, shot by Associate Press on April the 1st. Have a listen to their positive response. We are gathered at the square today to support Libya. We're not here for any particular name or person. We are here to support the establishment of a state. The Libyan people are suffering. Things have been getting worse day after day. But today, we see people smiling. There's happiness around. Enough blood, enough divisions. The Libyan people have endured enough. We lost our wealth with our own hands. And that is why I am personally here today to support the unity government. So you see a little bit of support there, Hassan. Um, there's a question here from Khadija, though, based on that. She says, do you think it's only uphill from here? What is the most important challenge that you think, Hassan, uh, that this new unity gover government needs to overcome to move forward? Well, I think, I think the biggest, uh, I think the biggest uh, obstacle for them will, will be security, will be um, you know, how, how to once you have people on your side, once you have, you know, the, this idea of getting the militias or getting the different security forces in the country uh, rallied behind you, how do you move on from there? You know, if let's let's say you rally all of these groups together, you go, you fight extremism, you you get rid of radicalized e extremism in the country. The country is all safe. Everything's great. We were almost there in 2012 after the after the um, <coughs> uh, after the war with, uh, with 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 Gaddafi, but then then what you know what happens afterwards we we keep getting to these points where yes there there, there is a common uh, enemy or there is a common goal that everybody can rally behind but nobody nobody ever takes it a step further mm. and, and looks at what happens next after that and, and i think that will be the, the, the real danger is that you know once we get to that point or once libya gets to that point um, you know, what, what does the government do? And I don't think anybody really has a plan for that. Bilal? I think Hassan made a point, but I think I know the answer to the question he posed. Uh, the, the thing is, we use militias to stabilize Libya. The, we gave them money and we gave them legitimacy. In 2012, in September 2012, the president of the uh, National Congress back then came out in Benghazi and called few militias uh, to be legitimate. These militias uh, lately, uh, later on became uh, extremist and dangerous and want more money. So, but, but in a way, isn't that? I can see Siraj's government uh, 
doing again. They're using the same militia that have committed a lot of trouble, a lot of crimes in Tripoli. Uh, uh, the Gargur uh, massacre happened in Tripoli two years ago by these same militias that he's uh, still using. And when he came back to Tripoli, these militias he cooperated with, I don't know, under his order or not. Uh -huh. They shut down a TV channel and they kidnapped a journalist. They, they're still st doing the same things and he's still I, using I them. I and I that, disagree I, with that. Can I, can I just say that I think, uh, I think the problem is that we don't really have a force in Libya that is um, a, a neutral force that could uh, be the perfect uh, ally to a government. I think at the end of the day, yes, the government, I, I agree with you that, um, that, that there is a massive uh, risk that, you know, if the government allies itself and supports certain groups um, too strongly, whether financially or whether politically, that they will just over, overrun the country once, once again. But mm. who, who else is there? There is no other group um, that, that, that can, uh, can security-wise, uh, do the, add do to the that. job. Yeah. Do, do, how, I just think how, that... Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, uh, uh, make your point very quickly because I, I, I want to go back to Malika just before the end of this part I, of the show. Sure. Go ahead, I just Aya. wanted to say that given the fact that the international community has now come full circle and admitted that they failed Libya in 2011 when they let them uh, left them to their own devices after the overthrow of the regime. So the international community has come back and is it wants to know how it can help Libya. Uh, like I said, they they have their own interests today, but I think it's a moment where Libya can say yes, you can you can help us fight ISIS by helping us but secure I, Libya but for I don't ourselves. Agree, but I don't agree because okay, guess because, just, just just take a take a pause for a moment, just because I want to fit in some community because the conversation is much bigger than amongst ourselves, Malika. Uh, this is a tweet from Hind Amri, pretty prolific on Twitter. And I'll give this to you. She says, I think we're just waiting for a political option that is in Libya's interest at this point. And we're at square one. Do you see this as a fresh start, a square one? I'm going to jump well, in here. I think I'll, I'll go on to what, what Hind said, but also to what Faya Sarraj said, which is reconciliation. And I think reconciliation is a really important point, which I'll just I'll make a very brief point and then I'll, I'll pass on to Ayaz. But um, I think the point is simple, is that unless you had, a, you know, to look at 2016 as a, as a fresh slate, you could, and I think you have to create a new narrative that is inclusive. And for reconciliation, you have to have a, a set of rules, a set of principles, you know, the rules of the game, effectively, for the next five years, 10 years, 20 years, for forever, that will have to be part of the Constitution, that will have to be part of the social contract, but also to just to govern the interim. We have to now, instead of selectively viewing certain actors as extremists, and others as militias, and others as good guys, or others as army, or others as police. You know, you have to have this kind of wide lens and accept mm. that we have to have a set of principles that governors. Those principles could be things like, right. you know, accepting the rule of law, accepting the ballot box, allowing for civil oversight mechanisms on top of your military apparatus, not obfuscating or, or, or creating an obstacle to, to civilian and civil oversight mechanisms and civilian rules. Okay. Those kind of things haven't happened, or when they have happened, they've happened with certain groups, but not with other groups. Now, unless you can bring all those, all those actors on the table together and, and unify them with these rules of the game, it's going to be very, very hard to have any kind of stable peace treaty or any stable movement in 2016. Okay, guess. Let me just ask you this. It's a very unfair question, but you are deep, deep, deep in what's happening in Libya right now. This new UN-backed government, on a scale of one to ten, success. Ten is success. One is, yeah, we've seen this already before. Hassan. Two. 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 Oh, he yeah. didn't even hesitate. Bilal. Two. I was oh. thinking of the same number. Oh, my goodness. I hope they're not watching right now. Ayat. Uh, I'm going to say five. They have a really uh, tight window to, to act, and we'll see what happens. Anas. God, question mark. I'll give a, I'll give a five. I'll set, I'll oh, set an hour. Okay, we have two twos and a five. Malika Valau, <laughs> what do we have with the community? Because he just says, as skeptical as Libyans are, everyone wants to grasp on to hope. So that's right. a, maybe a seven? <laughs> I don't know. I guess. Six I'm point, guessing there. Six point five. Mm -hmm. All right, we are not done yet with all of our guests. We're going to take Hassan, Bilal, Anas, and Ayat online to our post show at stream.outazero.com. The conversation continues hopefully with you there as well. Thanks for watching everybody.
Hello, this is the Streams Online Post Show. We've been talking about Libya's new government and whether or not it will be capable of ending the ongoing political instability in the country. Our panellists voted and we had two twos and a five as to their chances of success. Uh, um, do you know what I'm really curious about, though, is how Libyans are managing to live right now with all of this politics going on and the international community trying to help and all of the various players. How do people live every day? Bilal, what are you hearing? Can you give us an example? Well, life is very hard in there. Uh, the dollar is uh, almost got to the uh, four dinars and there is no uh, <coughs> wheat, no bread. And uh, the electricity go comes and goes. Uh, different uh, parts of Libya are suffering. The south of Libya is living uh, 1,500 years ago. It doesn't have any basic life necessities. Uh, Eastern Libya is still suffering. Western Libya is still suffering. All of Libya is suffering, but to different degrees. We will still have a war. People are getting tired of it. After five years of fighting, uh, I think that tired. one, one really interesting thing about the Libyan uh, population is that they were able to learn how to get by under 42 years of dictatorship. They're re really resilient people. Uh, so they are doing their best to go carry on with their everyday lives. Ooh. But it is getting harder to do in a government that doesn't function, uh, where the there is no currency and there is uh, there are very little resources. So it is it is kind of a growing humanitarian crisis um, across the board. But can I can I just be a little bit critical here and just step in and just say that I think also um, that, that that I feel I feel that the, the Libyan people are not. Um, responding as as they should to to this. I mean, mm. I, I I feel that they're not being active enough. I our civil society, obviously, after right. forty years of of dictatorship, is is very weak. Um, but Libyans in general, yes, they've had enough. But are they really making that clear to mm. um, to to their government? Um, which yes, government, they're, though, they're Hassan, doing... Hassan? Which government? Whichever government, whichever government is in charge. Like I, as I said, at the end of the day. Uh, every single constituency is being led by businessmen, by, by uh, militias in charge. You know, at the end of the day, these militias are not just random uh, strangers. They are the sons, right. daughters, fathers, whatever, uncles of families in Libya. If I do feel that when Libyans want to um, stand against something bad, they do it. We saw it in, in Gharghur, you know, uh, which was a massacre yes in, back in 2013 but libyans stood up against militias uh, in tripoli and and they they ousted those militias it was a bloody battle yes it's not easy but it's doable we saw it in benghazi after the ambassador chris stephen was killed everybody in benghazi rose up they 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 they, they raided militia bases those militia those militias headed for headed for for the hills yes we had a weak government that later on brought them back in but can I can I ask the, you what was the, the why do you, what do you think was the driving factor for that you know for people to kind of feel that they could break the silence and and take to the streets? How, how do you mean? I mean, uh, like like you said, there is no civil society. Can I answer this uh, media is also a tool used by these power groups. So, you know, there there's 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 an element missing that is going to drive people. The Libyan citizen, as we know it, uh, is absent. I, 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 I agree, something? but I think it's, yeah, go on, Bill. As one of the organizers of the story, and I have to just have to go in for this, which is the. Go, go on, uh, Anis. You, you have a distinct disadvantage because okay, you, I, I every, like time you point, you're, every time you're about to speak, there's five seconds delay, <laughs> and everybody else is jumping <laughs> in. So make some way, and that, uh, Anis, this, yeah. this is your time. Go ahead. <laughs> Well, I think you know, there, there, are, there are many groups that are on the ground and there are many people that say and come out and claim in the name of the people. And I think what's on the one hand that is an easy mechanism and it's only the useful mechanism at times of really distinct fear when you know, unarmed civilians go up against militias like in Marur in 2013 or in Benghazi also in 2013 in July. But at other moments it can also be used against them. And I think in that respect, it's very, very clear that what we're living under is a, is a, is a kind of environment of populism. It's what happened in the 1930s in Europe. It's also what allows for civil wars to emerge because people are desperate, and I don't think it should be in their hands necessarily to provide mm. all of the solutions. They can play a role, 
but I don't think they can take it on their hands and build a country single-handedly. And I, I, I definitely agree with Hassan in this kind of skeptical view of people, but I certainly also think that in one respect, we're, we're asking or demanding too much. Now, I don't necessarily think that we can always use and put out, out there and just say, look on the right, there's, you know, there's been a demonstration for what's happening in Barghazi or right. for what's happening in Tripoli or for what's happening in Masata because there are always counter demonstrations. It's very, very difficult to try to assess who speaks on whose behalf and organizations mm -hmm. like Libya Dawn, like Operation Dignity, the two military wings that have allowed this country to be in a civil war for the past two years, have used this to their advantage. Each government has come out and said, we're doing this on the behalf of the people. Each government right. has come out and said, we've defected. We've had defectors coming from this side or from that side. Each government it's has come out and said that we're trying to do this to fight terrorism mm -hmm. or to fight for the revolution. We've got to get rid right. of names and narratives. And we've got right. to go forward with a doctrinal, apolitical force, a force that can't speak for the behalf of people that just does its job. Bilal, I completely agree. Bilal, I know you wanted to get in here. I want to throw something to you. This is just some uh, sentiment that a couple people are sharing, and that is the backing that this UN-backed unity government has, and whether or not that's questionable. This is Fulan who says uh, the new unity government needs to prove that it is not just a powerless mm. foreign-imposed entity. And so I want to share with you a meme that some people are sharing. Um, this is a parachute, a UN parachute, and this is, uh, I would imagine, this is supposed to be a depiction of the prime minister Sarraj, who is uh, coming into Libya um, on, on the back of that parachute. Uh, Bilal, is this a sentiment that you know people share, that this is yes. imposed? A little bit, yeah. Uh, Sarraj didn't get the votes from the parliaments yet. Uh, Kobler, which is the UN uh, ambassador to Libya, uh, noted it earlier that uh, the uh, parliament still hasn't voted uh, Sarraj, and he's being treated uh, in Tripoli, as a prime minister, his cabinet hasn't been approved by the parliament. He's still not a prime minister. And this is, feels like, yeah, a little bit enforced. There is still no decision, no official uh, declaration by the parliament that Saraj is a, and his cabinet were approved. It feels a little bit enforced, yeah. But I think that uh, a lot of people, um, you know, I mean, I think a lot of people are overpaying um, also. Uh, the international community and how much they can do because I think secretly mm -hmm. in some in some people's minds you know um, they are, they are a little bit too wishful that the UN or the international community or NATO or whoever will just come and rescue Libyans from this chaos that they're in. Um, I, I know that Lib in the majority of Libyans definitely don't want a UN or internationally imposed government. They want something that is built by Libyans for Libyans, but uh, at at the same time you know they can't put too much hope in the international community. You know, I, yeah, you were mentioning earlier. Um, mm. that the international community, this is the time for them to step up and help Libya and whatever. But I, I don't see that happening. I think if the UN were to send forces into Libya or the international community or were to even start airstrikes and, and, and build that momentum. No, up, I'm not, I'm not that, saying that. I'm advocating for, for yeah. another uh, you know, intervention, per se. But that's what it looks like it's leading to. And these new Libyan leaders are not advocating for Libya's interests at the end of the day. I think that the, the scenario is inconvenient for the West today with the migrant crisis and with ISIS. And so that's why they are coming back to, to deal with this issue, not because of us. So it, it also plays back to, like you said, Libyans really need to take ownership and people need to do more than um, exist. And I have a yeah, fear about this. Uh, I have a fear about this because... There was 19 I'm months of a, of a civil war and there was 19 months of dialogue on the table between the UN and they've tried to bring on the minority leadership of the GNC, the minority leadership of the, mm. of the HOR. These are the two parliaments in each part of the country. They've tried to bring them on, but the minority leadership, those that are now today under the EU, have been sanctioned. Khalifa al-Ghuel, who's the prime minister of Tripoli, Nouri Abbas Ahmed, who's the president right. of the parliament, and Aghel al-Salah. And they're from both sides that are warring. So it tells you that mm. the two sides of the war are not interested in building peace today. And that seems to be the elephant in the room, is that the two sides that were there in the dialogue have not shown an interest in peace for mm -hmm. 19 months of that process, a large degree of it, over half of that process, they never met in the same room. They never spoke. The only time they did start speaking was when the UN started saying, we're going to go on without your signatures. And then they started something called the Libyan-Libyan dialogue. And they're still not agreeing. So the two mm -hmm. sides that were warring together decided to sit in the same room when the UN started to impose things on them. So it's always been a case of not peace on my terms sure. and not to have the other side in that, in that room or in that government with me. But, but it's the need the to try to yeah, dominate that's politics, that's this need to kind of be exclusive and have a monopoly over all, over all the government. And that's the main issue.
OK, yes, I'm going to wrap yeah. it up for now, but I totally understand why I got two twos and a five and two fives for the uh, success rate in your prognostication for how successful this new UN-backed government might be. Thank you for filling in some of the detail for us and carrying us through this conversation. Malika, what do you have? Well, when we asked our community what their expectations for this new government were, we got this reply from Aya. She says, I'm not expecting much, but I'm hoping for a lot. Hmm. All right. Thank you very much for being part of this conversation. I know we will revisit it uh, in the future. But for now, thanks for joining us on the stream today. Take care, everybody.